you to open your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 15. We get to meditate on the Word of God this morning. We get to hear God's Word. I want to pray that that would actually happen out of all of us. That it wouldn't just come from me, that it would come out of your own heart. That God would speak to you in thoughts of your own heart. God indwells us all. And so I pray that as I talk, uh, more importantly, God talks to you. So we're going to read uh, two sections. It's kind of confusing on the screen there, but 1 through 15 and then 25 to 29. I want to say up front that this is a bit of a transition sermon between the series on salt and light on the next, and the next series on sanctity. And it talks, we're going to talk about doing, doing things for God. And uh, it's not because I think uh, none of you are doing things. It's because God is holy, holy, holy. And we want to live into that ourselves. The memory verse for today says, Be holy because I am holy. Um, and that's what we want to do. We want to press into this uh, because of what God has done for us. We also have communion right after the service. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the technicalities of it, but the, the elders will pass it. And there's gluten-free in there. But the main thing is, is that you are invited to partake of communion if you believe in Jesus Christ, and if you actually want Jesus Christ in your life for your strength for every day. That said, let me read the passage. <clears throat> First Chronicles 15. After David had constructed buildings for himself in the city of David, he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, No one but the Levites may carry the ark of God, because the Lord chose them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister before him forever. David assembled all Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. He called together the descendants of Aaron and the Levites. From the descendants of Kohath, Uriel, the leader, and 120 relatives. From the descendants of Meriah, Asiah, the leader, and 220 relatives. From the descendants of Gershon, Joel, the leader, and 130 relatives. From the descendants of Eliathan, Shemaiah, the leader, and 200 relatives. From the descendants of Hebron, Eliel, the leader, and 80 relatives. From the descendants of Zeal, Aminadab, the leader, and 112 relatives. Then David summoned Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab, then the Levites. He said to them, you are the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. So the priests and Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God with the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. Then we're going to skip to verse 25. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of the units of a thousand went to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing, because God had helped the Levites who were carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Seven bulls and seven rams were sacrificed. Now David was clothed in a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who were carrying the ark, and as were the singers, and Kenaniah, who was in charge of the singing of the choirs. David also wore a linen ephod. So all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouts, with the sounding of the ram's horns, and trumpets, and of cymbals, and the playing of lyres and harps. As the ark of the covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David dancing and celebrating, she despised him in her heart. This is the word of the Lord. It was a little while ago that I was reading this verse, this chapter in the daily readings, and I looked at this and I thought, this is something that I need to preach. Because in this passage, King David wants to do something great. He has this thing with the ark of God, and he has this thing with the temple where he wants to do something great for God. And so he does this, and then he eventually wants to build a temple. He wants to do something great. And apparently in culture all around us, people want to do great things. Something that's going to happen this afternoon. Oops. Hmm. Wow, this is the wrong PowerPoint. Eh, oh well. Um, this is a really old PowerPoint. Actually, can you just shut this and maybe, 
I had no idea what to do. We'll just see how this works. All right, so something that's great, I don't have my little pictures, but something that's great that's going to happen this afternoon is Super Bowl 49, right? They're going to get together in a big stadium in Arizona, and they're going to have a great time playing football. 22 people at a time are going to play each other, and it's the pinnacle of what they want to do, what they've, they've wanted to do in our life, in their life. They want to be great. And when I look at that stadium, I see not only the football players who want to be great, I look at the stadium itself, and I don't know if you looked at the stadium, but it's set up to look sort of like a barrel cactus, or maybe like a snake circling around. Any of you seen this thing? Some of you are going, Super Bowl? What's Super Bowl, right? In any case, the stadium itself is cool because the whole grass area slides out from the stadium, and it goes outside so they can use it, um, they can water it, and the grass can grow, and they can use the stadium for other stuff, and they slide it back in. They spent millions and millions of dollars on this thing. They didn't quite think about how to pay for it, but the stadium itself is really, really cool. People wanted to be great. They wanted to do great things. And uh, let's see what we can redeem. Just put that thing back up there. You know, it's totally my fault. Uh, the PowerPoint is on my computer at home. I messed up. So let's just see what we got on this PowerPoint. Someday, I'm going to get this right, by the way. It kind of fits uh, the sermon top today. Let me just grab my little thing, so at least I know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, this is so messed up. All right, at least I got that. Okay, we'll be okay. All right, so uh, it turns out that it takes a fair bit of uh, work to be great. And what I was going to talk about is preaching, rather ironically. Um, I didn't always want to be a preacher. I didn't always want to preach. As a matter of fact, I was pretty sure I didn't want to preach. I grew up with my dad as a preacher. And I uh, didn't really ever feel called to that. But at some point, God started to put on my heart that... I should, I should preach. And uh, being the person that I am, I thought, well, the path to preaching is, I'll start preaching. So I talked to the people at the church I was working at and said, hey, can I preach? They said, uh, have you had any training? I said, no, but I really want to preach. And they said, well, uh, maybe get some training. So I started looking for opportunities to preach. Notice I didn't look for training. I looked for opportunities to preach. And uh, my neighbor was a Kojic, Church of God in Christ pastor, and he said, hey, you can preach at my church. So the first church I ever preached at was down on Division, a little Kojic church there. It was, uh, it was horrible. I mean, the church was great, but the sermon was horrible. I won't even tell you what it was, but instead of hope, it was despair. Instead of freedom, it was addiction. It was, it was epically bad. The 12 or 13 people there were just kind of watching me going, when is he going to be done, right? Eventually I was done, I left, and never went back. Then uh, I asked a friend down in uh, Ogden Dunes, Indiana. He was a Presbyterian pastor there. I asked him if he, uh, you know, maybe I could preach here. And he's a really good friend. He said, absolutely, you can come down and preach. They had two services in the Presbyterian church. It was about 60 people came to each one. And I had an interesting experience there. The first service I preached, and my words, they went kind of like, mm, and they just crashed right before the front row. Maybe the front row got something, but the rest of the people, nothing. It was just dead. No connection. So I walked around in the fellowship hall between services, and I didn't do really much, except I said, I hope that goes better the second time. And it did. It was really weird. I'm not sure exactly why to this day, but as I preached, it was just this connection, and it felt like I was talking to people in person. It was, it was amazing. After the service, this lady came up to me. She had her bulletin just covered with things she had written. I didn't say half of them, but the Spirit must have been talking to her. And she said, this was so amazing, just connected it this way and that way and this way. And I was like, I, that's, that's great. And uh, I went home and thought, that was really weird. And one didn't work, and then one did. So a couple of maybe months later, I went back, and the reverse happened. The, the first service was just really, it worked. I tried to repeat some of the jokes and stuff that came up in the sec first service and the second service, and it again, just went, just crashed. Like, they just looked at me like, this is the biggest idiot we've ever seen. It was horrible. And I went home thinking, now, what's, what's God trying to tell me? Um, maybe he's trying to tell me every other time you get an offer to preach, just say no. Don't do it. But maybe what he's trying to tell me is um, you need to get more training, right? There's gifts there, but maybe I need to get more training. So eventually I did. 
and I'm still doing that. And eventually God started to work in my life. It turns out that it's not only preaching where we, uh, we need some training, uh, need some experience, but it's also really anything in life. If we want to do something great, we've got to go get training. We've got to learn how to do it. So I was in a thrift store this week and I picked up this book. It's called The Dangerous Book for Boys. And I was looking through it and I thought, actually my oldest girl, Anya, would rather like this. And so I was going to scratch out boys, but it's written real big, so I didn't do that. And I gave it to Anya, and sure enough, she's reading through this and goes, hey, let's make a battery. So uh, she started trying to make a battery, and the instructions in here weren't that great. So we YouTubed it, of course, and we made a battery, and it actually worked. And then, uh, being the creative person that she is, she made a little case for it. And this is her flashlight, and there's a real battery inside of here, the only problem and these are a little light that we, uh, little LED light that we had. It's supposed to have real batteries in it. So the thing is, this works great for about 10 minutes. Um, and then the battery dies. But you put pennies and then zinc washers and then uh, vinegar dip pieces of cardboard. And it works great for about 10, 15 minutes and then it doesn't work that way. We need more training if we're going to get this battery working. And life is like that in a whole lot of areas. And I want you to think for a minute about what you want to be great in. What you want to do. Most of us have one or two things in our life that we'd really like to be able to do that we're not currently able to do. And I'm not talking about going and see the latest Hobbit movie or do this fun... I'm talking about identity things, things that we really want to do. I mean, think about that for a moment. What do you really want to do? If you're like me, some of the stuff we think about, the things that we really want to do, I think to myself, well, that's great. I'm going to do that. And the point from here to there is to simply start doing it. So I want a better relationship with my wife. I'll just have a better relationship. I want a different job. I'll just get a different job. I want to be able to exercise more. I'll just start exercising. I want to have better relationships with the people around me. I want to be more successful at work, more successful at school. I want to... And the, the default way our brain works is just to say, I'm going to start doing that. I'm just going to go over here and do it. But it turns out, that's really not the way the world works. There's often a detour, something else we have to do before we can do what we want to do. In our passage this morning, David has incredible success at bringing the ark of God up to the city of David, his city, and putting it in the tent. It works great, but it turns out there's a story behind that story, and that story is found in 1 Chronicles 13. And I'd like to, uh, you don't have to turn there if you want, but if you've got your Bible open, you're welcome to. And we'll see, what, uh, we'll see what version of the PowerPoint I have up here. I know there's some of the pictures I want, though, so. All right. So in First Chronicles, first, well, see, that's, it wasn't fixed. First Chronicles, not Corinthians 13, he says, Let us bring the ark of God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people. So you might remember the ark had been captured by the Philistines. It had gotten returned. It was sitting in someone's house, the Minadab's house. And it had been down there during the whole reign of Saul. Now David is king. He's been king for a while. He says, you know, it's not right that the ark of God, the place where God is, is down in somebody's house. Let's bring it up to the city. Put it back in a tent. That's what we're supposed to do. So they talked to each other and they said, let's just do this thing, right? Let's go and do this thing. This is what the ark looked like, by the way. Generally speaking, it was a box, poles, and then the cherubim over the top. It's just sort of a general thing if you're not familiar with what the ark looked like. So David and all the Israelites with him went up to Bala of Judah to bring the ark from there, ark of, from there, ark of God to the Lord who was enthroned between the cherubim. And that's what I want to focus on for a minute. This wasn't just a box. The, the thing was that God himself says, you make this box and I'm going to be enthroned, enthroned between these cherubim. It's called the mercy seat. Right away from the beginning, a seat of mercy. And I was looking online and found uh, this little website that made uh, Bible stories come alive with Legos. Um, it's pretty true to the story, so you might not want to just have your kids go through all these, but um, it's pretty powerful. I thought this was particularly good. This illustrates the presence of God on the mercy seat. So when they were going down there, they weren't just getting this box. They were going down there to get the very presence of God and bring the very presence of God from Amenadad's house up to the city of David. That's what they were that's what they were doing. And I'm just going to read on here. And 
So this is what they did. They moved the Ark of God from Amenadab's house on a new cart with Uzzah and Ohio guiding it. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God with songs and harps, lyres, tambourines, cymbals, and dancing. They were having a great time. Uzziah and Ohio were grandsons or sons of Amenadab, so they were familiar with the Ark, so they thought, we're going to walk alongside of it, make sure nothing happens. But then something did happen. When they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark, because the oxen stumbled. That's there. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and he struck him down because he had put his hand on the ark. So he died there before God. And I wanted to have the scripture verse up so you could actually see it. I think it's one of the most troubling texts in the Old Testament. They're moving the ark of God. They're doing what they thought they were supposed to do. This guy reaches out to keep the ark from falling on the ground and getting smashed. And God gets so upset, he kills him. And this Lego illustration really highlights it. Sort of takes the ambiguity out of it. God killed him for touching the ark. What are you supposed to do with that? Dead. I don't think I put it in here. Oh yeah, I did. Now uh, there his brother is going, no, no, no. Everyone's looking at this. Imagine this. They're dancing, they're celebrating, they're singing, they're moving the ark of God. Suddenly in the middle of the worship service, someone reaches out, maybe touches something like this, some sacred object, and just right there, he's dead. Or you're worshiping God. David, of course, gets angry. He says, I am so angry. I don't know what he said, really. But he said, I'm naming this place Outburst Against Uzzah. And that's what it was named, Perez Uzzah. And then, you know, because he's king, he, uh, I don't have that picture in there. And the king, he says, you know, I am done with this. We're going back up to Jerusalem. And he takes this ark and he brings it to somebody's house. He's like, take care of this. And of course, they can't say no because he's a king. But that could have been more than a little awkward. Like, okay, I guess we'll take care of it. And he goes up to Jerusalem. He is out of there. He's like, this is, this is a bunch of nonsense. How am I supposed to have the ark of God with me? So what are we supposed to do with this? What are we supposed to do with this story? Obviously, the first part of it is, don't mess with sacred stuff. Don't mess with things that are sacred. That's the lesson that we learn from this as a kid if we heard this story. You don't mess with stuff that's holy and treat it irreverently. Things that are holy are supposed to be treated as if they are holy. The ark was terribly important, the very presence of God. You can't just go out casually and touch it. Of course, they were supposed to carry it on poles between, uh, between Levites. They were supposed to carry it on their uh, shoulders. And of course, they shouldn't have put it on an ox cart in the first place. So they, they messed up. It should have been carried. They put it on an ox cart. But the main point is you're supposed to treat this with respect. I think on a deeper level, this week when I looked at this passage, I realized, and I've had this, where you think you're doing something for God, and you're doing it exactly the way maybe you just, your mind thought you were supposed to do it. But then when it doesn't work, something part of us, some part of us on the inside dies, doesn't it? You're in a relationship and it doesn't work out, falls apart, and it feels like part of you died. You're serving God, maybe you're doing some sort of ministry and all of a sudden everything falls apart, you lose your job, you lose this, something doesn't work, and it's literally part of you just dies. And suddenly we find ourselves in this text in a new way. Of course, this happens in ministries too, where things just don't work. And all of a sudden, like, what is happening? It's like, where is God? And the, last, the second question we ask, where is God? What is he doing? Does he care or not? And I bet if you're anything like me, at some point you've gone through this stage where you're like, what is God doing? I'm trying to serve God in my relationship. I'm trying to serve God in my work. I'm trying to serve God in my ministry. And just nothing seems to be happening. And we ask ourselves, where, where is God? What is he doing? And when we ask ourselves these questions about the text, we get more than just a lesson of treat things with respect that are holy. We also see ourselves in the story. And if we see ourselves in the story, then we begin to understand that there's certain things that David does that are biblical, that are the right thing that we, we can do. If you could just turn my gain down a little bit, Mark, that'd be great. What does David do? He waits and sees. He doesn't leave God, but he waits and sees what's next. If you read the chapters, he experiences some victory. He does some things for God. He doesn't leave, but he just sort of leaves this out. 
And this is so important if you're living life to wait and see. And I can't tell you how many times things haven't worked out in ministry or in life. And the approach was to wait and see what happens. Yesterday, we were talking to our family about something we want to do as a family. Maybe go uh, something for camping. And we said, look, we could make this happen. We could borrow money and make this happen. But what we're going to do is we're going to wait and see what God has for us. God doesn't not love us because this isn't happening. But we want to wait and see what he has for us. This is really not very American or Western. We like things right now. But waiting and seeing is an absolutely biblical thing to do. Um, this isn't the list that I already had. So let me think about what else I want to do. Um, oh, it's not in here. I'm going to check the PowerPoint next week before I start preaching, by the way. Check the clicker. Check the PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> pretty ironic, given what I'm preaching on today. Um, then he learns. What he does is he learns. He goes to the old text and he learns that actually there's certain people that are supposed to carry the ark and no one else is supposed to do that. And they're supposed to carry the Levites, the son of the Colthonites, are supposed to carry the ark. And he says, oh man, we did it all wrong. We put this thing on a cart with oxen and God doesn't want that. He wants it to be carried. And just this morning as I was thinking through this, like why does he want the ark to be carried? It's because he wants the presence of God in the middle of people and not carried by some cows. He wants the presence of himself in people. That's terribly important. He wants it carried by people because, of course, that's what he still does today. And then secondly, he does a lot of preparation, doesn't he? He just does a ton of preparation. He, you see it in chapter 15. He divides all the priests up into all, all categories. He's got gatekeepers. He's got singers. He's got people who are playing all sorts of instruments. As you read the Psalms, you realize that he more than likely wrote songs for this particular event. Psalm 30 that we read just a couple days ago is a psalm for the dedication of the temple that was written for that, even though David was then dead. He's more than likely wrote songs. He was quite a musician himself, probably. And uh, he just does a ton of preparation for this thing. And then, um, then he actually goes down there and he does it the right way. And uh, I can't think of my last point, but he does a lot of preparation for this thing. Bring it up. And uh, this is what I wanted to say. This isn't the slide, but this is what I wanted to say. It turns out, that if you want to be great, what do you got to do? You got to consecrate. That's the phrase that I want you to take home today. If you want to be great, you have to consecrate. What does consecrate mean? You have to set yourself apart. You have to consecrate. And so many times in our culture right now, today, we just think, I'm just going to go right there. But in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you have to consecrate. You have to set yourself apart in a whole variety of ways if you want to do what God has called you to do. Whether it's related to kingdom stuff or whether it's related to things that you just want to do in your life. Whether it's relationship or work, just no shortcuts. And when I look at this text here, I think, I don't know, um, let me just... These are all the things. I guess we could do this. Um, there's some things that we're called to do. And, 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 and one is scripture. We're called to learn. David went back to scripture and he learned from scripture what he was supposed to do. He also did a lot of preparing. He set things up. And um, oh, this is a mess. I'm just going to leave all this stuff. These are books that I've been reading. I'm just going to skip right to the end here. All right. This is what I realized. In ministry over the years, um, when I've tried to do things on my own, it, uh, it doesn't work. So some things that I just had good ideas for, I remember one time I did a Bible study in the evening, and I thought, I'm going to invite people over, and we're going to learn about evangelism. just had this idea. I just thought I was going to do it. And uh, it went nowhere. We had a good time. We had like two or three of us, but it just went absolutely nowhere. And then one time, uh, we started this thing called the Alpha Course. It was brand new at the time, and uh, we did a ton of work for it. Alpha Course is a 10-week introduction to the Christian faith, and it was hyped up huge, and, and people were uh, learning about it all over the country, all over the world, actually. I thought, man, we're going to run this Alpha Course. And they put a lot of a lot of emphasis on all the preparations. So we prepared, we prayed, we got a team together, we got food together, and it was, uh, it was a ton of work. I spent hours making these little brochures and handing them. I handed alpha brochures out to the whole neighborhood, handed alpha brochures out to everyone in church. 
We had a guest come in from another church to talk about Alpha, and it turns out that God used all those efforts in a tremendous way. A guy in church uh, that was hardly ever in church, he was really far from God, just doing all sorts of crazy stuff because he didn't think God loved him. He happened to be in church that morning, saw the lady and thought, man, if God can touch that lady, maybe God can touch my own life. Another lady in the neighborhood who, again, never came to church, she needed food and she had walked down like about two miles to another church for food and got some and then heard about our church, the Wednesday night dinner that we did and then came to our church, got some food, used the food pantry, heard about the Alpha course, came and became a, really became a Christian and her kids eventually became followers of Jesus. God used that in tremendous ways, in just tremendous ways. But then the next time, and the next time, and the next time, after we had gotten a little bit familiar with Alpha and we knew how to run it, I didn't do so much work for it anymore, right? Because we knew how to do it. The meals would happen, someone would always cook the meals, and uh, it was great. I sort of phoned in the play. We handed out the same flyers, and people came, and, and we talked, and we showed the videos. But nothing ever really worked like those first courses. And what I've realized time and time again is that the things we get out of what we do are directly related to what we put into what we do. And that works for a lot of areas of life, but especially the spiritual areas of life. For some reason, my brain constantly thinks that I can just take a shortcut to what I want in life and in ministry. So if I want a better relationship with my wife, I'll just talk to her more, no big deal. If I want people to come to Christ, I'll just kind of talk to people. If I want things to be different in church, I'll just kind of do it. It doesn't work that way. What we get out is directly related to what we put in. And God is calling each of us, and most of us know what he's calling us to do if we think about it. If we stop, rest, let God speak to us, give him space, most of us know pretty intuitively where he's calling us. It might be to give up sin. It might be to step out in faith. It might be to read scripture more. It might be to step out of our game at work. It might be to stop being so controlling to the people around us. It might be to set up boundaries so people aren't so controlling to us. Most of us know. But the fact of the matter is it takes a fair bit of work and learning and research and dedication and planning to actually get the results out of our plans that God has put on our heart. The phrase is, if you want to be great, you have to consecrate. You have to set yourself apart. And then it all comes back to this passage. In this passage, what's happening is David is going to get the ark of God, where the presence of God is in the middle of the seraphim, seated there on the mercy seat. And that's where this passage really connected with me. Because what we're doing is we're not just engineers or bakers or welders or teachers or we're people that are called to take the very presence of God into the lives of other people. In the Old Testament, it was pictured there as between the seraphim on the ark, and it was the middle of the middle of the city of David. But I love how that reality is pictured there where the priests are supposed to carry this. It's not supposed to be put on an ark. It's supposed to be in the middle of people. And in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit lives within people in a really awkward, unusual, unexpected thing that God himself actually lives in people. And that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be. That's why it's worth doing the work, doing the preparation, doing what God has called us to do, because he wants us to do this very same thing that David did, to take the presence of God from here to there. But we have to be willing. We have to prepare. So the questions that I do want to ask you are simply this. What is God calling you to do? What is God speaking to you through this passage? Not what am I speaking to you, and we need to get this idea out of our head that God is out to ruin our lives. There's one person who's out to ruin your lives, and that's the enemy. And the enemy tempts us with thoughts like, what you really want to do is you want to have fun. You want to have parties. And you want to do this. And you want to do that. All the enemy wants to do is destroy your life. That's all he wants to do. All God wants to do 
is give you life. And it seems like more work up front, but all he wants to do is give you life. To bring you into things that you never expected. That's all he wants to do. So what is God calling you to do? Not me, not your neighbor, not your wife, husband. What's God? Speaking to your heart. And often you can figure that out by exactly, it's the very thing you want to do on a deep level. And the second question is simply, how are you going to respond? It's your choice. I'm not going to come to your house and sort of pressure you. How are you going to respond? We're going to go into communion after prayer. And so the third question I want to ask is, are you willing to invite Jesus into that? So many times we try to do things in our own strength. And we need the redemption, and we need the strength of Jesus Christ within us to do what he has called us to do. So are you willing to invite Jesus into that? And with that, let's pray. Father God, just like this uh, PowerPoint this morning, we are a mess. We are a mess. We're fallen. We're broken. Some areas of our life look so good and other areas don't look so great. But Lord, we want to be something more than we are. We desperately want to be something more than we are. But some of us just need strength to do what you're already calling us to do. We already are living that out. And we thank you so much for that. Others of us, we have this area that might be hidden, it might not be hidden, that we so want freedom in. We so want to be able to think differently, to give things up, to interact with people differently, to be different. Lord, we need your strength. Lord, we know we might not know, but we more than likely know what you're calling us to do. And we pray that you would fill us up and give us strength for what you, are self, you yourself are calling us to do. We need your strength. Lord, on the cross, you give us your very self. You didn't come into the world to condemn the world. But you came into the world to save the world. To save the world. To save the world, Lord. To save us. So today as we take communion, we invite you in. We think of your bread as nourishment. Lord, we need your nourishment. We need the very bread of life. We think of your wine as a blood transfusion. That we need your blood running through our veins. We need your power flowing through our veins. We need the forgiveness that can only happen through your blood. That we thank you for the new covenant where nothing has to die because your sacrifice has been made. And so we look to wheat and to grapes to signify your covenant. That we don't know exactly where you're calling us. But as the phrase says, you've, you've gathered this wheat together from many fields into one loaf. You've gather, gathered these grapes from many vineyards into one cup. You're gathering your people together. And today as I think about this, you're also equipping us to be sent out to gather more in your kingdom, to work for your kingdom, to act for your kingdom, to bring your kingdom in new ways. The kingdom is already, but not yet. And you called us to bring more of the already into the not yet. So I pray that you do equip us as weak, as inadequate people to be more and more of who you're calling us to be. Lord, you are God. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.